Will you please bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this beautiful day you've given us. So grateful, dear Father, that we can gather here before you and praise your name, sing songs of praise. Hear your word to Heavenly Father and take it to heart and to know that you're with us. Pray to Heavenly Father for those that are not able to be with us, be with those that are ill and sick, be with the Milwee family right now, dear Father, and Macy and the child. Pray for them, dear Heavenly Father, and that your hands will be upon them. Pray for the Ross family, dear Father, for Jesse's uh, Kratz friend and the surgery she has upcoming, that things will go well for her. Pray to Heavenly Father for all our members here, that you'll keep us, dear Father, in your arms. Protect us from the evil one. Deliver us, dear Father, that day when it should come that we can be with you in heaven. We're so joyful, dear Heavenly Father, to be able to participate together as a family and to show you, dear Heavenly Father, the love that we have for one another and for our fellow members. Guide, guard, and direct us, dear Father, in this service we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Start out by singing song number 121. Number 121. Do all in the name of the Lord. No so me do me so do. Next song will be number 335, number 335, Into the Heart of Jesus.
every Sunday. We take this opportunity in our worship to prepare ourselves to take the Lord's Supper. Consider with me, though, if you are new to this. You may have some questions. You may have noticed this morning we've already sung songs of praise. We've communicated with the Father in prayer. And because we, you know we approach everything we do in worship with humility and gratitude, why are our minds not already prepared? Why is there an emphasis on the Lord's Supper? Part of that preparation we understand is that we're helping to prepare each person's mind. It's impossible for the speaker or those in charge to anyway prepare your mind. It's an individual subject. But it is also something because we need to recognize that the Lord's Supper is different from praying and singing. It is the only act of worship that we participate in when the church has assembled. Scriptures remind us of the remarkable agreement or covenant that connects each one of us with the Lord and through him with each other. It emphasizes that we're no longer bound by sin, but have started a new life with God. Now this new covenant allows us to lead a new life with purpose and intention, reflecting our commitment to the Lord. You see, it describes how Christ's sacrifice has freed us from the weight of sin and prepared us in a heavenly inheritance. All this is possible because of the sacrifice of our Savior. So we respond the same way as all who have followed the Father. We joyfully obey God's commandments. We've been made clean so that we can serve God. That means we prepare our minds to come to the table with gravity and gladness. We rejoice that God has made us worthy to enter his presence. We thank him for his kind supply of daily bread and living bread. As we participate in the Lord's Supper, we remember our agreement with God, which was made possible through his death. So as we consider what Jesus did for us on the cross, we relive our part of the deal. Does it make us want to work harder for him? How much more will we serve him in the next week? How thankful are we for Jesus' sacrifice? Will our actions show that gratefulness? Are we keeping our promise to God? I believe that's what it means to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. In conjunction with Larry's talk, we'll sing song number 516, number 516, One Day. No so me do me so, one day when heaven.
Shall we give thanks with a loaf? Dear Father, we come to you in prayer, thanking you for this opportunity that you've given us to gather around this table. Father, we give thanks for this bread, knowing whose body it is and what it has done for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, and our Lord. Pray, Lord, that we would remember this time each week with dignity and respect and thankfulness. And I pray, Lord, that if there are any here that have not made that decision yet, that they would come now. We pray in Jesus' name.
before we take up the collection, we will sing, sing song number 362, number 362, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. I, I really like the first two verses of this song because it mentions pretty much everything on this earth that God has given to us. But the ending of the first verse talks about the giver of immortal gladness. And that doesn't even touch the joy that we will feel when we are with God for eternity. Number 362. Do so me, do me, so do me. Joyful, joyful, we adore. The story is about a congregation that wanted to help others. There was a group that was starving. They had had uh, years of famine. So the group decided, the congregation decided they were going to put aside funds so that they could send money to that congregation. They didn't know how to do it. There was no guidance. And so Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, and told them, the money that you're gathering together, that you're going to send over to that to, to help those Jews in Judea, those Christians, well, you're going to gather it together on the first day of the week when you're all put together as assembled, and then you will have it ready when the time comes for it to be sent. Now, what he didn't mention is what we do individually. Think about the Old Testament for a second. The Old Testament, they had to give you know, a certain amount right into the group. But also remember this, for example, like farmers, they had to leave part of their fields un, what word do I use here? Unharvested, yes, those hard words that I can't think of. And so what are they doing? As individuals, they're helping others. But as a group, they're also helping others. That happens in the New Testament today. The congregation spends its money to help in benevolence, other Christians, and also to spread the word. That's what these funds are for. In addition, you spend, and I'm sure you do, knowing you, a lot of money on your own to help individuals in other ways. That's how God wants us to work. That's how he set it up. He didn't necessarily make a commandment on the first day of the week. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. Instead, he set guidelines and said, if you're going to have a group of money together in a treasury, this is how you collect it. This gives, this gives some guidance. And that's what we're doing right now. Shall we go to God in prayer? Our Father, we thank you so much for everything that you've given us. We recognize that all belongs to you, but we also recognize that which you have given us, you have put in our hands to decide how we're going to use. We pray, Father, as we do all of our life, that we use it to your glory. That as we put this money in this common treasury, that it will be used to your glory. That as we go through our lives and we give individually in so many different ways, that we do it to your glory. 
Because, Father, we recognize that all in all, that's all there is, your glory. In your Son's name we pray, amen. is from Joshua, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 19 through 25. It says, Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil of a beautiful mantle, from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. Then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath it. They took, uh, they took them from inside the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the sons of Israel and they poured them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tents, and all that belonged to him. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you in this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones and they burned with fire after they had stoned them with stones. I think y'all should thank the elders for letting me sit up here, because otherwise you'd add another 30 minutes to our services, me walking back and forth. So very much appreciate that. If you would like to mark your song books at song number 212, that will be the song after the lesson this morning, number 212. And the song before the lesson, number 44, number 44, Anywhere is Home. Let us be standing for the song if you are able. No, so me, no, me, so. Earthly wealth and fame
Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Indeed, again, wonderful to see our visitors with us as well. I also am thankful to the elders that it's not taking Clay an extra 30 minutes to come up and down. Otherwise, there'd be a lot of points cut this morning. But it is good to see everyone once again. And it's interesting, if we ever think of humanity, and I, oftentimes, I guess, just because I have nothing better to do with my life, uh, I, think with, I often think of some of the trends and the ways that we as human beings think and act. And I'm sure many of you, especially those of you that are older than I, have come to realize that we as human beings are extremely impulsive creatures. And here's what I mean by this. You ever walk into a store and you're just there to buy one thing and then you walk out of the store with a cart full of things that you didn't know you needed yet? Or you, I know for me, I walk in the Best Buy and it's like, okay, I'm just here to buy this one thing. And then I walk out with a TV. We are very impulsive. Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, I don't know what I need until I go in it. This is why some people, and you know who you are, should not go down every aisle at Sam's Club or Costco because you're going to walk out with two carts full of things. It's because we are impulsive. We think, I need this thing, so let me have it. We don't think through sometimes the long-term effects of those decisions. Did I really need a Costco-sized bushel of bananas that I throw half of them away after two weeks? Probably not. But impulsively, we're thinking, well, I need this right now, and man, I feel like eating a lot of bananas this week. Not thinking through the fact that we never eat all the bananas. That's just a silly example. We don't think through the overall consequences of our actions and the small things, and sometimes that impulsiveness can come into the big decisions as well. And that is what we're going to look at, is two individuals this morning. We're going to look at two different stories. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask that you would turn over to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25 will be the first story that we look at. And we're going to look at two individuals whose lives drastically change or are impacted by short-sighted or impulsive decision-making. As we see here, you know, sometimes we don't really look very clearly through our choices. And I think one of the best stories that exemplifies this is when we look at Esau in Genesis chapter 25. A little bit of background, we are here during the patriarchal period. Jacob and Esau are just born in chapter 25 to Isaac and Rebekah. And Rebekah receives from the Lord a message that the lesser will serve or the younger will serve the older, the lesser will serve the greater. Now this is not something that really comes through much in there, much in conversation that we see, but this does have an impact later on with some of the story. But what's interesting is both boys grow up, Isaac who is, or not Isaac, excuse me, Esau who was born first, is the older brother by a few minutes, and then Jacob, who comes out holding on to his heel, is the younger brother. And they both quickly divert in personality and in vocation. Esau is the manly man. He's the hunter. He goes out and he gets the game. He comes back. He's what many of us men are like, that's what I'd love to do with my life. I just want to be a hunter, go out, shoot things, come back, and then someone else make the meal for me. And... Jacob is the one who stays at home, tends the flocks, stays with mom, and they're very different people. And the story that we're going to pick up with in Genesis chapter 25, and we're going to start in verse 29, is something that happens when Esau returns from a hunting trip. 
Verse 29, when Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, first sow me your birthright. Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. So what use to me is the birthright? And Jacob said, first swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. All right, so interesting example here that we see of Esau's character. He demonstrates that he is a nearsighted individual. And obviously we don't mean actual eyesight. We see in this passage that Esau sells his birthright, his inheritance, for a bowl of stew. Lentil stew of all things. I don't know if that sounds the most appetizing to me, but apparently to Esau it was worth his birthright. And just as a quick cultural context, the birthright was what, that which was given to the oldest son, and it was a double portion of the inheritance, and the younger son did not get that double portion. So the birthright that is being talked about here is that in greater inheritance that the older son will receive. And Esau gives that away for a bowl of stew. Now let's be fair to Esau. He's really, really hungry. Right? We've all been there. We come in from a long day of work and go, man, I'm starving. I feel like I'm going to die. A little overdramatic, isn't it? He comes in, he tells Jacob, I'm going to die of hunger. So give me that stew. Now, let's put this in context. Isaac and the family of Abraham, or the descendants of Abraham, they have quite a following. They have a lot of oxen and sheep and servants. We know this because we are counted Abraham's resources and then Isaac's resources as they are passed down. They had servants. All Esau had to do was go and fetch someone and say, hey, go prepare me, you know, a wheat cake or something to that effect, or go make me some stew. All he had to do was wait 30 or 45 minutes. Now, I am not a scientist. I do not think that that's enough time for Esau to actually die of hunger. Don't quote me, I'm not an expert on that. It's, the, it's so emblematic of the short-sighted, impulsive thinking of humanity is that he was more concerned about the immediate gratification and the short-term fulfillment of me hungry, me want stew, give stew. Well, give me your birthright. Okay, I'm that hungry. Let's put this more in context. If someone said you were so hungry, and someone said, sure, in 10 years or 20 years, I want you to give me $10,000. And I'll give you this stew right now. How many of us would take that deal? If you're hungry enough, you might consider it. Now that's sort of underplaying, to be honest, and, and overgeneralizing what Esau did here, because it's much greater than that. But it kind of puts it into context for us. Is he's getting a bowl of stew, just a little bit of short-term satiation for his stomach, and he is giving up, in the long term, a massive boon for both him and his potential family. But he doesn't care about that, does he? Because he says, what does Esau say? Behold, I am about to die, so of what use is the birthright to me? 
We may laugh at that. But there are human beings that would trade a whole lot for just a little bit of short-term satisfaction. And we'll talk more about that point in the future. And if we don't think that this has an impact on Esau, this one decision to have a bowl of stew and give away his birthright completely changes his life. Let's turn over to the book of Malachi very quickly. Malachi chapter 1. We have a mention hundreds of years later. There is a mention of Esau in the book of Malachi describing, and it is God describing his, his view of Esau and how he is to be remembered. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob. But I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a desolation, and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Jacob I love, Esau I hated. Why did God's enmity exist between Esau and Esau's descendants, the Edomites? One of the reasons, there's more than one, but one of the reasons is what we see at the end of Genesis chapter 25. He despised his birthright. He was given a gift to be the leader of the descendants of Abraham, and he gave it away for a bowl of stew. He gave it away because he couldn't endure a little bit longer to go and get his own meal or have his own meal prepared. It could have been at most two hours for him to get a meal, but he couldn't endure that little bit of suffering any while longer. So he makes a decision that radically changes his life. If you know the story of Jacob and Esau, Jacob ends up becoming the head of Abraham's inheritance and receiving not only a blessing, that's a different story, but also the inheritance and becoming the patriarch, the head of the family that becomes Israel. And that happens because of this one decision that Esau makes. Because he couldn't last to be a little hungry or to be very hungry for a little while longer. Now our other story that I want us to look at, we already looked at it a bit in our scripture reading this morning, but if you would turn over to Joshua chapter 6 and chapter 7. And here we have a story that sort of surrounds the fall of Jericho. Now, that name, Achan, is probably not a name that many of us remember very readily unless you really, really are into obscure Bible characters. Achan doesn't have much about him, but there is a significant role that he plays in the early conquering of Canaan by the Israelites. In chapter 6, we see the conquest of Jericho, right? We tell the kids this story, you know, they march around the city, they blow the trumpets seven times on the seventh time, the all, walls all fall down and then the kids all fall down because they were marching in a circle. Did that as a kid many times. We, it's a very famous story. But the part that we don't often read is there's a section in chapter 6 when the how or when the walls are about to come down on the seventh day, Joshua makes clear an edict of the Lord, starting in verse 17 of Joshua chapter 6. The city shall be under the band. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all those who are with her in the house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the band so that you do not covet them and take some of the things under the band and make the camp of Israel accursed and bring trouble on it. But all the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. And then thus happens. 
All of the people in the city are killed, and all of the items are either put in the treasury or burned and destroyed. Jake Joshua is very clear of the consequences. Do not violate this ban, or you shall receive the curse of God. You will be cursed by God if you violate this ban. If you take anything from the city, you will be cursed by God. There's no ambiguity here. And he says this to the all of the people of Israel. So no one can claim ignorance. Nor can anyone claim, well, you weren't very clear. No, cursed by God. I feel like that is crystal clear. If you take something, cursed by God. Now, with Achan, what happens after this in chapter 7 is Israel loses their first battle since leaving Egypt. They lose to the nation of Ai, a small nation that they should, they really had no business in losing to. But it was clear to Joshua and all of the, who were present that they lost because the Lord was not with them. Why was the Lord not with them? Well, Joshua inquires and he finds out through a series of tests and messages from God that there is someone named Achan who has brought the curse of the Lord down upon the nation of Israel. And this was a section that Blake read for us in chapter 7, starting in verse 19. But I want us to also skip down to verse 24, and that, that is where we will read again. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. They raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day, and the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. Achan makes a choice when he goes into Jericho. He sees a nice mantelpiece that probably looks very valuable and ornate, and he sees a nice weighty bar of silver and some various other trinkets. And he says to himself, I want those. Those are pretty. Those are valuable. They will bring me wealth. They please my eyes. And so what does he do? He takes them. Knowing full well the consequences. Joshua was not, again, not ambiguous. But he thinks he can get away with it. Now, logic would dictate. If we're thinking, if Achan was thinking about this situation logically. Hmm. Should I violate a ban for the same deity that just made the impregnable walls of Jericho fall. Maybe a bad idea. Maybe the God that can part the Red Sea can probably know if I take some stuff from the city. Maybe I shouldn't do that. That's a bad idea for my long-term well-being. I don't want to be cursed by the being that can make the impregnable city fall by a bunch of people marching around with trumpets. Bad idea. But no, what happens? Money, potential wealth, pretty thing. I want, I take. And what is his consequence? Similar to Esau in that he is guided by short-sighted thinking, by wanting immediate gratification, and what does it lead to Achan? His death. Not only the death of himself, but the death of his family and all of his possessions. Very quick side note here. Some of you that have not studied this deeply or haven't heard this story in a while might be thinking, well, Robert, how is that fair that his family, his wife and his children, 
are killed for sin that he causes. I thought that one does not inherit the sins of the father, that one cannot be guilty for the sins of another man. They weren't guilty of Achan's sins. What they received were the consequences of Achan's sins. Guilt of sin is something that lies upon the individual. However, one can be completely blameless of a sin, but yet still receive the consequences of the sin of another. We can think about this in an extreme example when it comes to the sin of adultery. One person, it's not just one person who is caught up in that sin and has to pay the consequences. The children who then are in the middle of a divorce will be paying those consequences for many years to come even though they did no sin themselves. They still have to experience the consequences. That is reality that sin has consequences for more than just the person who commits the sin. It doesn't mean, though, that they are guilty in the eyes of God on a spiritual level, on a moral level, for those sins. It means that they're receiving the consequences of someone else's sin. I just wanted to... That was a little bit of a side point here because it's a question I often hear when this story with Achan is brought up is, well, why did God punish his family for something that he did. God is making an example here of when you violate God's law, when it says you will be cursed, you will indeed be cursed. Showing how drastic it is to violate the law of God. But why does this happen? Let's think about this and analyze these stories and what they have in similar and we can see this from some New Testament passages. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. If we're thinking about the things that we have in the Father and we have in God, our inheritance, if you will, 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3, talks about this inheritance. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Just like Esau, we have an inheritance. If we follow after God, there's an inheritance that waits for us. And then in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, the things that we have because of Christ and because of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. When we look at these stories, we see the folly with Esau and with Achan, we see the folly of thinking in the short term. Which shows us that as Christians, we need to be thinking in the long term because it is beneficial for us. Why do we say this? Because we are tempted on the short term. We are tempted by fleeting things. If we think in the long term, we will be able to make an evaluation of things that are valuable to us and whether or not in a logical sense or in a cost-benefit analysis, if it is worthwhile to give up what we have for the short-term gratification of what sin and what the temptations that we face offer us. Now that's a fancy way of saying this. What are we tempted by? According to James chapter 1, and that he says to us that we are tempted when we are carried away by our own lusts and temptations that will then give birth to sin. What are our sins and temptations? If we are to break them down into a very basic level, 
Sin is almost always short-term. And in many ways, they're the same sins that Esau and Achan were tempted by. In John, in 1 John chapter 3, John there lays out three categories of sin. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and boastful pride of life. You can see those present in the stories that we talked about. The short-term gratification of saying, well, I want food for my stomach. Lust of the flesh. With Achan, that mantle is pretty. That gold would be nice for me to have. Lust of the eyes. And we even see this with Jesus. What is Jesus tempted by? Short-term things. Now, Satan is giving his best shot when he tempts Jesus. Sometimes we overlook that fact. Satan is trying his hardest to tempt Jesus. So what does he tempt Jesus with? The most basic necessities of life. Jesus, don't you want some food? Turn this rock into some bread. Jesus, you can be the ruler of all the world. You need only call forth your power to do so. I can, as Satan, I can give you the entire world, Jesus. Boastful pride of life. <coughs> those sins, those temptations are short term. None of them will last. The pleasures of life, how long do they last? They last for while they exist. And usually, not for very long. And sometimes you may think, well, Robert, they could last for years. Well, what is that in comparison to eternity? What is that in comparison just to the hum average human lifespan? It's fleeting. It's short. It's immediate gratification. It's want of things that will not last. What we have in God, the inheritance, will last for how long? In 1 Peter, what does he say? That is imperishable. Will not decay. Will last how long? Forever. In heaven for us. And later on in 1 Peter chapter 1, he compares our inheritance as more valuable than gold. That's what we have currently. That's the inheritance that we have if we stay in God. But what happens when we sin? We make the same choice that Esau makes. Give up the long-term inheritance, the thing that is more valuable than gold, for a little bit of gratification now. A bowl of soup. A pleasurable time. Making myself happy for a moment. But what are we giving up? We're giving up something that will last forever. But what do we have to have in order to keep those things? To look beyond just what's in front of our eyes. To look to the long term. Because in Christ we have everything we could possibly need in the spiritual realm. Ephesians, Paul is 100% clear. All spiritual blessings, not some, not most, all the spiritual blessings that we can desire, we have in Christ. So let's break this down in almost in economic terms, right? On one hand, if we invest into Christ, we invest into God. What do we have as a return or in, in our investment? A salvation that lasts forever. Every spiritual blessing that we could possibly desire. And if we look at Matthew chapter 6, I know we've been referring to that passage a lot the last couple of weeks, but if we look in Matthew chapter 6, if we seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34, we have all the necessities of life provided for us. Those are the things that we have when we invest into God and we invest into Christ. Now what do we have if we fall and follow what sin has to offer? What does sin have to offer? Well, you'll be happy for a bit. You'll feel pleasure for a while. You're going to be rich for a second. You'll have what you want for a moment. Now, on a logical level, and I know 
that when we talk about sin, we're talking about things on a more emotional level. But this is how we think short-sighted, is we only think about the emotional level. Thinking long-term, we need to use logic and use that to discipline, and this is something we talked a lot yesterday for the men that are in our, uh, our, Bible, or our Bible study that we had yesterday. We talked all about discipline. It takes discipline to think about things logically, to think about things in the long term, because the long term is something that we can't see, feel, or touch, because it's still far away. The short term are tangible. That's easy. But if we think about this logically, what are we giving up? The same thing that Esau gave up. His birthright. His inheritance. And how valuable was that to Esau? Well, when he gave that up, it changed his entire life. And I would argue, when we give up God, if we do not think in long term, and we are overwhelmed by the short-term possibilities that sin and temptation lead to lend toward us. What are we giving up? We are giving up, up something invaluable, more precious than gold. Now, I know that feels like I'm hitting you all over the head, and that's not my intent. My intent is to put this in stark terms so it sticks in the mind, because let's face it, it's very easy to get overwhelmed in the moment. Right? I've been so hungry, I could eat a horse. Right? We, yes, I've clearly eaten lots of horses. It's one of those things that we can so easily in the moment feel like that's all that matters. It's that short-term gratification. Give me food now. Give me something now. And it is the mature individual, the mature Christian that can look and take a moment and say, okay, I can just wait a moment and I don't have to pay the hefty price. If I go through a little bit of suffering now, a little bit of uncomfortableness now, it will be so worthwhile in the future. And it takes discipline to think of that in the moment. To take a deep breath and go, wait a second. Is the decision I'm making going to put my inheritance, my spiritual future in jeopardy? And that's what we have to do is discipline ourselves, immerse ourselves in the Word, immerse ourselves in the delights of God so that when those tempting moments come, we can think this is a short-sighted decision. This is a bad spiritual investment. What am I giving up for this choice? That's what we can do so that we don't fall prey to the same temptations and the same pitfalls that Esau and Achan fell into. Because we, as human beings, and especially as Americans, we think very short-sighted sometimes. We don't think about the long-term consequences. And the long-term, the thoughts of salvation, what we have in Christ, is what keeps us from our temptation. It's what guards our minds. That's why salvation is referred to by Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 as a helmet. We use the idea of salvation, that long-term inheritance, to guard our mind like a helmet from the temptations, the short-sighted thinking that exists now in our lives. Now, if we're going to talk about investment, Every investment starts with someone making a choice to invest. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you hear what we talk about with salvation being a long-term benefit that is more valuable than gold. If that is something that is appealing to you, something you want for yourself, well, then you have to make the commitment, make the investment. And how we do that on a spiritual level to follow after Christ, to make that spiritual investment is to first believe, truly believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, to confess that belief in front of witnesses, to repent or turn away and walk in a new direction from sin, and to be baptized 
fully immersed in the water for that confession and repentance. If that is your decision that you would like to make this morning, we are here for you. And we would be happy to help you along that journey to make that choice, to make that investment. So if that be your desire, we ask that you would please come forward while we stand and sing the invitation song. I want to thank Robert for his lesson. Those are thoughts we continually need to remind ourselves of as we go through everyday living and life. Men, remember at 345, if you can make it, your presence would certainly be appreciated when we start a training class this afternoon. Also, at 5 o'clock, we have, uh, again, our evening service. We'll have class uh, Mitch Milway will continue his study on the book of John. And then uh, midweek, 7 o'clock Wednesday, Robert will continue his series on the book of Daniel. We want to uh, once again thank our visitors for being here. We consider the word of God of utmost importance and your presence confirms that you do as well. So it certainly does encourage us to have you spend this hour of worship with us. We have a couple of requests. There's visitor cards in the back. If you could grab one of those in the foyer or tap one of the members on the shoulder and, and get it for you. And if you can spend a few moments while we introduce ourselves and, and get to know you a little bit. We're very thankful for your presence. One other thing. 
Art and Laura Lee Moore made it this morning, so that's good. They've had a series of uh, bouts and infections and illness, and so we're very glad to see them as well. And on that note, we'll ask Tyler Robinson to lead us in a closing prayer. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for letting us be here this day, even though I know it was not promised to us. We thank you for letting us be able to gather together and learn more about your word and, and be in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that you would be with us at this time as we're about to go throughout our week, that we would be able to stay strong and do what is pleasing in your sight and look to you and look to our, our brothers and sisters in Christ when times get tough for guidance. We pray that you would be with us as we walk through this world, that we would be able to be a light to others and bring as many people as we can to you. We pray that you would watch over us as we travel back to our homes, that we would be able to get there safely. And we pray that you would be with all of those of our number that were mentioned this morning that are sick or ailing at this time, that you would put your healing hand upon them and bring them back to their normal health. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
I say we're going out to eat, and she's already left. Thank <laughs> you. 